Okay, so it is 12 o'clock noon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Julie Easel with the Office of Isotope Research and Development and Production with the Department of Energy's Isotope Program in the Office of Science. Welcome to the Isotope Program's informational webinar on the Research, Development, and Training in Isotope Production Funding Opportunity Announcement. Before we begin, I have a few logistics to go over. This meeting is being recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted next week to the Office of Science website. I will drop the links into the chat. The slides being presented today are on the website already. There, are, there is a closed captions available. Please click on the closed captions button to enable them. After the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please use the Q&A box in Zoom to ask your questions. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ethan Balkin, who is the Federal Program Manager for Radioisotope R&D for the Office of Isotope R&D and Production. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending upon where you happen to be in, uh, in the US. Um, let's just go ahead and get right into it. Maybe, I hope. All right. So. The, uh, the first thing we're going to do, as we always do in these webinars, as well as anything else that uh, occurs uh, within the office as an official function, i um, just going to briefly go through our statement of, com of commitment. This comes to us from the Office of Science microsite on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there is a link that's posted in the slide deck. Uh, as Julie said, all the slides are already posted online. You can find the links there, and I believe Julie will be dropping some of these links into the uh, the chat window as well. Um, the chat is disabled, uh, but you can use the Q&A function. You're encouraged to do so uh, to put any questions into us that way. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read you the, uh, the bottom two paragraphs. Uh, the DOE Office of Science is fully committed to fostering safe, diverse, equitable, and inclusive work, research, and funding environments that value mutual respect and personal integrity, effective stewardship and promotion of diverse and inclusive workplaces that value and celebrate a diversity of people, ideas, cultures, and educational backgrounds is foundational to delivering on the SC mission. The scientific community engaged in SC-sponsored activities is expected to be respectful, ethical, and professional. The DOE Office of Science does not tolerate discrimination or harassment of any kind, including sexual and non-sexual harassment, bullying, intimidation, violence, threats of violence, retaliation, or other disruptive behavior in the federal workplace, including DOE field site offices or at national laboratories, scientific user facilities, academic institutions, other institutions that we fund, or other locations where activities that we support are carried out. So I would ask that everyone please just uh, um, act in accordance to the statement of commitment. And uh, with that, we'll go right into the webinar for today. So there's a brief agenda. I'm going to walk you through the, uh, the FOA itself. We'll talk a little bit about specifics, um, how to read it, how to interpret it, how not to interpret it. Um, and uh, then we'll open up for Q&A and uh, anything that, that you would like to ask to the program directly. So um, as far as being transparent about the goals of this particular FOA, um, it stems from three specific uh, topics. So the first one is that the isotope program is committed to supporting the cutting edge R&D that is necessary for the U.S. to maintain its presence as a global leader in the field um, and to foster the development of next-gen workforce. Um, going along with that is the concept that uh, um, isotope science itself can't be pigeonholed into one specific discipline. So when you're considering making application to this or any other FOA uh, that the isotope program issues, one should always be conscious of the fact that um, just because you don't necessarily have a production capability at your institution, or should you not in any, at, at, at that point, uh, it might not necessarily eliminate you from participating in competitive R&D and engaging in workforce development. In fact, um, you, you may have capabilities 
uh, in other areas that other institutions are lacking and that they might wish to really develop a strong collaboration with. And we encourage that. So lastly, there are some regulations that prohibit discussions that might be perceived as providing competitive advantage. Um, obviously, I can't engage in providing those types of advantages, uh, but we are happy to uh, answer questions regarding any nuanced language that appears in the FOA, what the intent of the FOA is, as well as general responsiveness of an idea to the solicitation itself. Um, any other questions are going to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, and uh, we'll answer them to the fullest extent possible. Um, all right. So the current FOA is uh, Solicitation 3063 and has the title Research, Development, and Training in Isotope Production. It was published on May 5th. Um, so if you're following along based on the PDF file that you can get uh, from uh, science.energy.gov, um, then you'll want to make sure that you have the correct FOA open, and it will open in Acrobat with uh, a window similar to what you see on the screen. Um, I will point out that I'll be referring to page numbers, and um, I will utilize the page number that is circled in green at the bottom of your screen, as opposed to those circled in red, because there's a, a disparity between the two. So I'll be referring to the PDF page numbers, or the I'm sorry, the document page numbers, as opposed to the PDF page numbers. All right. Um, who's eligible? So all colleges and universities, nonprofit research institutions, and DOE and NSA national laboratories are eligible to make application to this particular solicitation. By um, special request, private industry is ineligible to participate either as an applicant or a subaward recipient. Um, these are in keeping with previous FOAs uh, that issued by uh, the program, these are two-year awards. Um, Multi-institutional teams are, are encouraged, whether those are implied for as a prime applicant with sub-awards or as a true collaboration. Um, and in the case of a multi-institutional team, uh, the request is limited to no more than 750,000 per year so a total of 1.5 million over the life of the award for the entire effort, not for each institution. It's a key point to, me, uh, to, to keep in mind. If you're a single institution proposal, uh, same ceiling applies, 750,000 per year. Um, and uh, one should also re uh, uh, remember that um, DOE Office of Science speaks in terms of uh, uh, total funds as opposed to directs or indirects uh, being separated out. So these are total fund uh, budgets. Okay, um, MSIs are always encouraged to apply. And then that develops the question of who can a sub-award recipient be? Um, any of the eligible institutions. So um, that brings up the next question is, what's the difference between a prime and sub-award proposal and a collaborative proposal? In a prime and sub-award proposal, you've got a, a, a leading institution. Uh, for the sake of argument, we'll say that that lead institution happens to be a university. They might wish to have a certain um, uh, PI from a, either another university, um, another nonprofit research institution, or even a national laboratory, conduct some particular scope of work but that scope of work is really just a service that's being procured in furtherance of the actual scope of work that's been proposed by the lead PI at the lead institution or the prime institution. In that case, the sub-award recipient is actually nothing more than a line item in the uh, lead principal investigator's budget. You're procuring a service from that, from that uh, uh, researcher. In a true collaboration, you would have two proposals submitted with the same title and the same narrative. What differs is the scopes of work that are proposed at each institution and the budget and justification, obviously. So in that case, 
you have multiple PIs. You have the PI at the lead institution, and then you have the PI at the collaborating institution or institutions, and they are seen, all, uh, all PIs are seen as playing an active role in the direction of the scope of work that's been proposed. Um, and if there are questions about that, we can discuss uh, uh, after the fact. Uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a complicated concept, but uh, most people catch on pretty quickly. All right. So if you want to collaborate with folks, uh, where are the sites that DOE Isotope Program utilizes to do the things that we do? You'll see in front of you a map of the U.S. Um, you've got a mixture of national laboratories as well as you'll see some, some academic uh, uh, research institutions. Um, those academic sites are part of what we uh, refer to as the University Isotope Network. Those, uh, the, those uh, network participants uh, have unique facility as well as um, personnel uh, that are, are highly skilled at what they do and capable of carrying out um, routine isotope production. Uh, and we utilize those facilities and leverage them to uh, uh, make sure that uh, the nation meets its, its um, isotope demands. Um, with respect to the national laboratories, we'll go through uh, who they are, where they are, and, um, and so forth in the next couple of slides. So accelerator slide, uh, sites, and we can split the national labs into three basic categories. You have accelerator sites, you have reactor-based sites, and then you've got, um, quote unquote, other isotope activities or other isotope production sites. So we'll start with accelerators. You've got Brookhaven um, National Laboratory. They have a Linux isotope producer. It's a high energy um, uh, proton accelerator. Um, and you can see the, uh, the beam characteristics of that site. Uh, the previous slide showed you uh, some of the things that they're working on in terms of the isotopes they're producing. Similarly with Los Alamos, you have uh, the IPF, which is the isotope production facility. So slightly less beam energy, but much higher current. Um, and I should point out that uh, these two sites uh, run off cycle of one another because both are, are proton accelerators, uh, they back each other up. So when Brookhaven is producing, uh, Los Alamos is down for preventative maintenance and vice versa. Uh, you also, we've also got uh, Argonne National Laboratory with uh, a low energy um, electron accelerator uh, and its beam profile is characterized in the first bullet. Um, right, moving to reactors. Uh, we have Idaho National Laboratory's ATR, the Advanced Test Reactor, um, primarily used for production of cobalt-60, although there are other applications at, at uh, Idaho National Lab um, that are, are either under development or being considered. And then um, by far the, uh, the, work for, the workhorse uh, of reactor production within the, um, the portfolio of DOE IP is Oak Ridge National Lab's uh, HIFER, or High Flux Isotope Reactor. Um, and the suite of processing facilities uh, at Oak Ridge as well that feed into what their activities uh, happen to be. Some of these other isotope uh, uh, production sites, um, we do some work at Y12. Pacific Northwest National Laboratory has uh, um, extensive expertise in process automation as well as um, conduct some, some separation science uh, and dispensing. Um, there are activities at Savannah, as well as the newest of the um, uh, of the scientific user facilities within the Office of Science, uh, FRIB, or the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams at Michigan State University, uh, where those folks are, are actively engaged in R&D, as well as implementation of isotope harvesting uh, out of a beam dump and other areas. Okay, so I spoke briefly earlier about the University Isotope Network. There are some unique capabilities and expertise, as I mentioned, but this uh, network was largely born out of the idea that there were uh, certain cases 
where isotopes might either have a short half-life um, or be needed uh, in smaller batches, these, these quote-unquote boutique isotopes, um, which would be better uh, facilitated through universities than through trying to schedule batches at a national laboratory, um, which would just uh, serve to increase the cost uh, and or um, in certain cases, national laboratories might not have the correct beam uh, to be able to produce them. Uh, specifically, the case of astatine 211 has come to mind, um, and that was the first isotope that we started with the University Isotope Network. Um, so uh, those uh, those members are listed on the uh, on the screen at the bottom, uh, and we can talk more about those if you have questions at the end as well. Uh, so the questions that often develop after seeing those first few slides are, are where can you find points of contact at the various labs and UIN sites? So there's a, uh, a hyperlink uh, that's in the slide. Uh, will also be in the chat. Um, and that's a, 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 a point of contact list. You're free to reach out to those folks and they can best direct you to the people at their facilities um, with whom you might establish collaborations. There's also a list of uh, um, who are currently identified by Department of Education as MSIs and the various, uh, the various categories of MSIs that exist. Um, that's that second hyperlink in the second bullet. I encourage you to take a look there. That's the, uh, uh, the most current list, although it's not exhaustive. Okay, so let's get truly into the meat and potatoes of the FOA. Where do you begin? Well, start with page one and read to page 10. That gives you general flavor for the overview of what the solicitation is truly seeking. So the first question is typically, the FOA mentions that responsive submissions will address one of the bullets listed on pages two and three. Does the isotope program expect to only receive proposals to those topics? So I would encourage you to carefully read that section because there is a quote unquote or clause written into there. Um, and that would then feed into the second question, which is our is our application less competitive if we utilize that or clause? Um, not necessarily. However, I would point out as is stated explicitly in the FOA uh, that the highest priority topics to the program are listed. Um, and this is a good point to bring up this particular topic, which is read the FOA without interpreting anything. Um, take it at face value. And if you have questions or feel like you need to interpret something, that's when you reach out to the program. But the FOA is written in a way to be very transparent and um, uh, stated succinctly. Um, all right, so the next question that I typically get is, I have a pending submission where the scope of proposed work will be substantially sim similar to or duplicative of the scope of work I intend to propose to this FOA. Is that allowed? So the answer is you can submit the same scope of work to multiple solicitations as long as you acknowledge it in the current and pending support selection, uh, section of your submissions. But duplication of funding is not allowed. So if the decision to fund both submissions occurs, then the Cognizant program managers will reach out to, um, uh, to the PI and either negotiate the scope of work that's going to be funded to ensure lack of duplication, or we'll ask you to pick which, which award you would like to receive. Um, and that's another question that we can delve into a little bit more if you'd like. So pages one through 10 also describe specifics regarding allowable costs and slash categories, right? And uh, those allowable costs and categories have dramatically increased in the past couple of fiscal years. Um, I really encourage everyone to take a look at them. Um, you can find them specifically laid out on pages six and seven. If an item is not listed, contact me uh, or type your question into the chat um, because it's not an exhaustive list, 
but um, uh, it's worth asking if you have an item that you're thinking of that isn't listed. Okay, so what next? Well, your work scope should be based on a model where the R&D that you're proposing can be completed within the established performance period of 24 calendar months. Um, you know, it should be a, a, a book-ended scope of work that you reasonably think you can complete. That's a standalone statement. The next question um, is probably going to be based on something that you'll read. And on page 56, it states, uh, the FOA states that funds are not presently available for the award, but previously in the FOA, it also states that awards will be made in, F made in FY23 and 24. So, and we also state that it's subject to the availability of funds. So how should one interpret that? So it is nuanced language. Um, our intent uh, is to make a, ba a batch of awards using our FY23 uh, appropriation, uh, which we currently have. Um, subject to available funds in FY24, we'll make a second batch of awards. Um, but we have no idea what the magnitude of that budget is yet. So that's why the second statement sort of appears. Um, but it's not to say that uh, anything has changed. So um, it shouldn't be taken as, a, as conflicting statements. Um, all right, next question. Why is there such a dramatic difference in the appearance of this FOA from previous FOAs with respect to uh, what DOEIP used to send out uh, in R&D? Well, it's kind of indicative of the growth of the program and the development of um, a very robust program of research over the better part of the last decade. Uh, when the FOA was initially released um, in the, uh, the first part of, of uh, I want to say 2011, um, uh, there wasn't much in the way of the availability for um, the community to seek R&D to engage in isotope production related activities. That's changed thanks to the FOA, thanks to other funding opportunities as well. Uh, and we now find ourselves as a program in a situation where the, uh, uh, the swimming pool is vast and uh, we needed to establish some swim lanes. So um, in an effort to be transparent, we established priorities that are listed within the FOA and that's what's driving this. Um, recognizing, of course, that there might be things that you can think of that um, aren't listed there, which has that uh, or clause, as I as I described, uh, but it's still got to be relevant uh, to the program. So um, I think that 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 stands on its own. Um, all right, so specifics of the FOA. There are no pre-applications or letters of intent that are required. Uh, proposals are due no later than 11.59 uh, p.m. Eastern time. Please be mindful of the time zone as well as the dates um, because once that window shuts, uh, it's shut. Uh, the table of contents in each of the FOAs is uh, hyperlinked within the document. So clicking on that is uh, the most convenient way to navigate through what could be a 100 plus page document uh, to get to the correct section. Um, I don't need to read all of these bullets to you. Uh, you should concentrate on pages 14 to 21. Um, that's where the majority of the sections that we anticipate seeing in a uh, responsive proposal can be found. Uh, it also discusses formatting and the appendices that must be included, right? So um, make sure to, to, to capture the things that are listed there um, and pay careful attention to page limits. It's also a very good idea to have your SRO read those pages as well because sometimes they catch things that you might miss. Um, pages 24 to 26 discuss the review process, 
the review criteria, as well as program policy factors that may be applied. Um, and uh, I'm going to say one thing about peer plans, um, and that's uh, beginning in 23, so this particular fiscal year that we're currently in. The Office of Science uh, has begun to require uh, what we call promoting inclusive and equitable research uh, or peer plans, along with the research proposals. They're to be included as appendices, and you'll see um, requirements uh, listed in the FOA as on the previous slide. Um, these are requirements for all proposals that come to SC solicitations. Um, there are page limitations. There are um, various components that we anticipate seeing, but a peer plan from solicitation to solicitation can vary dramatically, and it should be tailored to the, uh, the actual solicitation that you're dealing with. Um, there are some guidelines uh, that can be found um, uh, if you use the link that's listed on the bottom lines of this particular slide. Uh, and it'll it'll give you hopefully a good feel for what's uh, anticipated to be uh, submitted and what the reviewers will be looking for. All right, I'm going to stop sharing because I've exhausted my slide deck at this point. Um, and uh, we can take questions. So Ethan, we've had just a few questions in the Q&A. So just a reminder, please, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in in the Q&A section um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just uh, a reminder that commercial entities cannot participate in this FOA. And that is due to the isotope program is prohibited from competition with the commercial isotope industry. The slides are already posted. I have put the links in the chat. Um, if you're having trouble reaching those, just let us know. I also put the links that um, Ethan mentioned with respect to minority serving institutions and the uh, promoting inclusive and equitable research. Those links are also in the track or in the chat for you. So we do have a question, Ethan. How many proposals may we submit as a primary or co-PI? Very good. Uh, the DOE isotope program does not limit the number of proposals per institution or per, or, or per PI. Okay. Hey, um, another question. There are some, I'm assuming Trigo reactors not shown in the slides. Would you like to see them? Uh, to apply. The reactors that appear in the slide deck, uh, as I stated, are solely those which appear, which are members of our university isotope network. And um, that's why there are other university-based reactors and other university sites that aren't on that map. As to whether or not a facility, um, as to whether or not the isotope program would like facilities to apply or not, uh, we issued the solicitation uh, to provide an opportunity to the community to seek R&D funding. If you have a, a compelling idea um, and, and you'd like to, to throw your hat into the competition, we encourage applications from all entities uh, as established under the eligibility criteria. I apologize, I didn't have my camera on. Um, so the, this starts out with the, thanks for the information. We will all read the provided document carefully. The title of the FOA covers a lot of ground, R&D, development, and training. What does the office anticipate in terms of focus for competitive application? Will applications need to touch on all three? So I would suggest that you take a look at pages one through 10. Um, 
compelling applications uh, should, I mean, you, you'll see in the, uh, in not the summary section, but the, uh, uh, the general section and pages. Oh, I believe it starts on page two or three, uh, where it specifically lays out uh, the FOA. Um, there is some language in there that describes that um, uh, competitive applications typically include training, um, as well as uh, um, other aspects that the program considers to be high priority. Um, as to whether you have to touch on all three uh, aspects, um, you know, uh, um, I think that's something that uh, each PI will have to, uh, to discern for themselves. Um, and uh, you can, you, it, it should be fairly, it should be fairly plain in terms of, of what we are seeking when you read pages one through 10, and then again, 14 to 21. The next few are kind of in a similar vein, but slightly different. To what degree will the emphasis on fundamental research versus applied research impact the success of the proposal? Ah, okay. So, um, as a um, as a program office within the Office of Science, DOE only funds basic science research. We do not fund applied research. If you want to make an application for applied research, that's a different funding agency. The work that the isotope program funds. Uh, is considered basic science um, up to a certain point. So, you know, I, I have to make certain assumptions here. I'm going to assume for the sake of argument that the researcher in question was considering a potential medical application, in which case there is a clean line that is drawn between where DOE funding would have to end and where NIH or some other funder of, uh, uh, of, of biomedical-based research would have to begin. Um, and, um, you know, that typically occurs uh, at or near the, uh, the question of efficacy in a living system. I can discuss in, in detail if the person wants to reach out. Uh, next one, would the research on particle beam sources listed as an R&D point in the FOA also include the development of a mass separation capability with an offline ion source to produce high specific activity radioisotopes? Potentially, yes. Are high-risk ideas encouraged? Absolutely. The DOE isotope program lives on high-risk, high-reward research. Can the proposal exclusively revolve around cold work? That's a double-edged sort of a question, if I've ever seen one. Um, so potentially, Yes. You know, if you're an emerging research institution and you don't have uh, uh, your research or your university, your, your institution does not have a license to possess radioactive material, but you can fundamentally do uh, quote unquote surrogate science on a quote unquote cold isotope of the same element and that fits the needs and, and addresses uh, the, uh, the, the, the nature of the work that you're proposing. And, um, you know, as long as the, uh, the reviewers don't have a problem with it, I don't have a problem with it either. At some point, one would anticipate that uh, it would translate over to quote unquote hot work, either at the site where the work was first proposed or via collaboration. And that's that's for the PI to decide. But uh, at some point we would prefer if it's going to be hot, that we see hot work. 
for the separation of radium from your uranium and thorium ores, is it sufficient to separate the element or must the separation target specific isotopes, for example, radium-226? Uh, the question is up for the PI to decide. Both would be acceptable. Does the current FOA focus solely on production or does it also consider separation? I suppose I have to ask the question in what context, right? Because separation science is part of processing. Processing is what happens post-production. Unless, well, yeah. Um, unless you're considering enrichment, in which case separation is quote unquote production of your of your enriched isotope. So I suppose the answer to the to the to the question is uh yes. <laughs> right? It's got to focus on everything, all aspects. Is there someone we should contact to advise on some of the proposed ideas before the deadline? I'm the technical contact. Um, you can you can reach out to me. My information is located within the body of the FOA, um, uh, I believe, on the first couple of pages, uh, as well as the last couple of pages because we bookend things. Um, uh, yeah, so you can you can reach out directly to me. Is the NIDC product catalog considered an acceptable source of radioisotopes? I suppose I need a little more uh, uh, clarification, an acceptable source. So the NIDC is uh, the business arm of the DOE isotope program, right? It's a virtual store uh, front for, for isotopic sales uh, of products developed by the isotope program. Um, is it an acceptable source? Absolutely. Um, in some cases, it's the only source. Um, I would, and this is a good point, uh, this is a good time to bring this up. I would highly recommend that if you're going to apply to this particular um, solicitation, that uh, you include, oops, it looks like I've lost my moderator. Um, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll roll with the punches. Uh, I, I highly encourage anyone who is going to make application uh, to this particular solicitation to obtain a quote for the cost of any starting material they might need um, for several reasons, um, but not the least of which is work funded by the DOE isotope program um typically receives the isotope that they need to do the work that they are funded to do at no cost from the program. So if it's in your budget, I can then strip that portion out. But if you don't include the cost of the material, I can't add it in. You also have another question, Ethan that the NIDC announcements recently have indicated greater availability of many isotopes. As an example, bromine-77 and bromine-76. Are isotopes such as these of little interest for this FOA due to their stated availability? If something is already available, then uh, seeking production in it um, might find lower um, might find lower programmatic relevance. Um, you know, that's that's as much as I can say about it. Uh, we, unless you can identify something that is substantially going to uh, increase yield and or purity over what the existing uh, capabilities are, then, then, you know, it's been funded, it's in the catalog. There's no reason for us to really look at it again. Is any preliminary data required in a proposal? Always a good idea to anticipate the questions that the reviewers will have. Um, 
but I can't say that uh, there is any requirement for any data. You have to make a compelling scientific argument. How you construct that argument is up to you. This programmatic relevance statement should be in future FOAs. The field would find this very helpful to understand what is most compelling for funding. We completely agree, hence its appearance here. Thank you for the feedback. Is the area of, nucle of nuclear nanotechnologies acceptable area of research? As long as it is uh, responsive to one of the topics that appear, one of those five or six bullets, uh, then yes, you know, independent of the uh, of the bin that you choose to to put yourself into, um, you just have to be responsive to one of those bullets. Will software licenses be treated similar to material procurement from a budgetary point of view? And let me know if you need me to take that one. Yes, please do. Okay, <clears throat> software licensing is an allowable cost when the software license is reasonably necessary to perform the appropriate scope of work. However, we would caution that licenses for general purpose software are more likely to be covered through your institution's indirect cost pool rather than as direct costs to any particular award. That said, propose the costs you need to accomplish the work you propose. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> pleasure. Does this FOA also cover separation of silicon 28 from silicon 29 for quantum computing? Uh, I would encourage uh, reaching out to me uh, to establish a, um, uh, an offline conversation, please. And right now, the questions seem to have slowed down. <laughs> it's okay. I have complete confidence in your research community. They will come up with more questions. Oh, I'm sure. There we go. Indeed, we have agreement. All right. My apologies. I'm probably over caffeinated for this webinar. So for those that don't know, uh, the distinguished gentleman who is currently running uh, um, uh, the question and answer period along with me is, is uh, Mike Zarkin. Um, Mike is the office director for uh, Office of Science Grants and Contracts. And uh, within at least the headquarters building, he's the one uh, who both facilitates the um, the announcement that goes out that that you all see the FOA, as well as make sure that uh, the package we send up to consolidated service centers in uh, in Chicago uh, is in appropriate order, um, and and make sure things things keep marching along. Um, so he is a a wealth of of knowledge that uh, uh, that we all depend upon. The good news is that after 20 years of research administration, I have neither lost a program officer nor a researcher. Nor do we intend to start. Here, here. All right. Well, it is, oh, there we go. Okay. Can you please re-explain the OR clause for the priority topics? Will scoring be adjusted for priority topics? Does that mean you need to explain scoring and review matrices? So um, I would encourage everyone to take a look at the list of what are called program policy factors that are contained in the section on uh, the review. Um, in there, just read the, you can, you can just read the, uh, uh, the paragraph related to the explanation of what program policy factors are, and then you'll see the laundry list of the program policy factors, some or all of which might be applied. And I think that will answer your question. The OR clause stipulates that, uh, 
we recognize that those are the highest priority items to the program right now. But there might be something that uh, someone's mind develops, which would be um, compelling to the program. And we did not want to just have a, uh, a slammed door um, seeking responses to just those six those six bullets. Um, that said, the swim lanes are helpful. It shows the community um, what, uh, what what we believe is the highest priority R and D uh, and the direction that uh, we're seeking this particular FOA to cover. We have another question about where the recording of this webinar will be accessible. And the answer ah, yes. is it will be posted along with these, these slides from this webinar on both the Isotopes microsite and the Office of Science Grants microsite. If you could find the slides, you will be able to find the recording, but please give us about a week or so for the automated transcription. Yep. Uh, where, where you... Where, where you were able to find the actual solicitation is where you will find the slides and the recording. All right, we have a question about elaborating on the collaborative proposal submission route. And if you don't mind, I'll try to take a first swing at that. Please do. Okay, the difference between collaborative proposals and prime and subs should be entirely driven by the nature of the relationship between the various institutions in the team. If someone is truly leading the effort and is more in a command and control position over the other team members, that describes a prime and subs model. If, however, it is more a network of peer level institutions working together for the same objective, that's more a collaborative proposal route. In a prime and subs model, our objective is to make one award to the prime institution who will then manage and therefore directly control the work at the subs. In a collaborative proposal process, our objective is to make multiple independent awards to each of the selected team members who are then going to perform their own work, again, presumably in the same direction to advance the same objective, but no one institution is capable of telling other institutions exactly what to do to reach that objective. In a collaborative proposal process, it's therefore critically important that we receive exactly the same research narrative from each of the proposed team members. Each institution needs to propose its own budget, describe any unique facilities or equipment, and provide material about the personnel at that specific institution. But presumably, if you're working as a collaborative proposal, you need to have one common research narrative from every team member. Did I hit it for you? That's everything, yeah. <laughs> ah, might be thinking that I've actually done this before. Historically, many awards have gone to a small number of institutions is there a component to the review process that motivates new sites that have not been funded by DOE in the last decade or more? Absolutely. Take a look at the program policy factors. Will there be double-blind reviewing for this FOA? No, there will not be. Can proposals be anonymous to reviewers to provide non-biased reviews? No, there cannot be because the personnel are an integral part of the Office of Science review policy as established by regulation. Sorry to steal your thunder on that. You're good. Can you share the reviewer metrics charge by which the reviewers score each proposal? Uh, so the, 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 well, so the charge elements are listed uh, um, and uh, they were described in the, uh, uh, in the slide uh, as well as in the FOA. So you can see exactly what the reviewers will be, uh, will be reviewing based on. Um, you know that's that's if you can address those metrics if you can if you can address those those charge elements then uh you've set yourself up for the uh, uh the highest possible score that you could potentially receive okay. 
Are there any stipulations regarding funding U.S. citizen versus, versus non-citizen students? Absolutely not. The only thing to be mindful of is that if you are planning to perform work at a DOE site or facility or national laboratory, non-U.S. persons may have an additional screening process before they gain physical access to that site. However, that is physical access to a DOE site that has no bearing to what you may do on campus. Is DOE enforcing the provision of a living wage to graduate students working on funded projects? No. The Department of Energy has no authority to impose or enforce a minimum wage. However, we may encourage and we do encourage all institutions to consider what flexibilities may exist within their internal policies and procedures to advance the objective of a living wage for all personnel. If the submitted proposal to this FOA is similar to a previous submission to a different FOA from the DOE, would this impact the acceptance to fund any of the submitted proposals? Yes, we will not fund the same scope of work twice. If it was declined, you're more than you're more than able to resubmit. Given the difficulties, delays, and change of staff associated with COVID, is it acceptable to submit proposals that expand upon and complete a previously funded scope using the same technology and lessons learned? Yes, that would be a well. That would be an expansion of previously funded work on a terminated award. That's absolutely acceptable. Also How known as also known as the 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 D part in R and D, right? That's the development part. You're expanding. How are reviewers chosen? Uh, reviewers are chosen based on subject matter expertise. Uh, peer review is an integral part of the uh, um, the proposal and funding um, uh, activities of the Office of Science. We guarantee a a high quality. Uh, unbiased review by subject matter experts, but I do not guarantee that the same review panel will be used year after year. That's just based on availability of personnel and the pool of proposals received. Can principal investigators also be reviewers? They can uh, be in the reviewed. same solicitation. There you go. <laughs> Presumably, if you have proposed work under a solicitation, you are conflicted from evaluating your competitors. Yes. Oh, come on. We've got eight more minutes in the Ethan and Mike show. We need more questions. There's one. What are the top three isotopes that IP is interested in? I would I would direct you back to the bullet points. Um, there's no way for me to say one, two, three. Uh, they there are categories of things that we are interested in and rankings in each category. So uh, I would I would look at uh, I would look at the bullet points uh, that are listed in terms of the high priority research for the office. And um, if there are examples listed, uh, you can you can take those as you will. Is research to advance existing techniques for isotope enrichment of interest? So, um, it feels like it's getting into the discovery science versus applied research. Well, there's, there's, there, there are several components to this answer, but the answer is that there are sub substantial investments being made in aspects of isotope enrichment by the isotope program. Um, if you're intending to engage in that type of R&D, then I would suggest you reach out to, uh, to me uh, to request a, uh, an offline meeting. Um, 
I want to make sure that before you waste valuable time and resources developing an idea to maturation, that uh, um, you're within the correct swim lane boundaries. Anybody else? If not, you all know where to reach me and how to find me. <laughs> of this, I have no doubt. Oh, there's one. Okay, what would be the acceptable level of isotopic and chemical purity for the proposed isotope of interest that a PI could propose? How much wood would a woodchuck chuck? Yeah, that's really difficult. I think you just need to come up with your um, with your best your your best estimate, and um, you know you're you're going to put in you're going to you're going to submit your own proposal. Uh, I'm not going to define a uh, a relevant limit across the board. Is there a second one? Uh, the second one was a thank you. Oh, here we go. Is it okay to have a collaboration with private companies outside the USA, such as IBA? So, um, if you you mentioned the word collaboration, there the the, the PI uh, or the, the the researcher who asked the question mentioned the word collaboration. A collaboration uh, in grant speak indicates that an award would be made. Um, in the first few slides, we indicated that uh, um, industry was not eligible to receive an award. So the answer to that question would be no. Um, if, if we're talking about a financial collaboration, if, however, it's purely an intellectual collaboration, whereas someone on the scientific staff at IBA was your best friend in grad school and you still like bouncing ideas off of each other and no money is going to the company i don't it's think different. that's a problem right that's that's a little bit different um and so what i would say there is um yeah i would say uh, i would say schedule a meeting just to make sure that uh, uh what's actually going to be who who's actually who's actually going to hold the ip that's developed Right. Okay. And with a reference to intellectual property from the isotopes program, I've just heard too much about IP. Indeed. And with that said, I believe we are approaching time. We are. Folks, I appreciate your time. Oh, do we have one more? Is it a thank you? Uh, we, have a, we have a thank you message. All which right. It's always appreciated because. Gosh knows we civil servants don't get enough warm and fuzzies. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your willingness to spend the hour with me. Uh, and uh, I am at your service if you have questions uh, regarding this FOA. Um, and I look forward to seeing what the community can develop. Um, thanks very much. Take care, folks. Thanks all.